Uh, open up with a quick prayer. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love this choice of the anthem, Wayfaring Stranger. It may sound like it's a song or a hymn about wishing that we could die and go to heaven or looking forward to that time when we could die to go and go to heaven. And certainly that's one level of meaning for it. But whenever we hear those kinds of songs, especially songs that came from oppressed people, especially songs that came from marginalized people, or any of that bluesy kind of sense of wishing for that other world, they all have this world implications. They're all about people who are struggling in this world to feel at home and they don't, and they hope for that, that home over yonder, which could just as easily be Texas. It could just as easily be Maryland and the United States and Canada as it can be heaven for them. Amen? When I preach, I'm, we're in this a se summer sermon series on important social issues and reflecting on those biblically, morally, and ethically. When I preached a couple of weeks ago on uh, reproductive rights, and even when I talked about transgender uh, issues and um, advocating for transgender people, I emphasized that these are complicated social issues that we're taking ancient texts and trying to apply to modern day. And so we have to be very cautious and very careful about how we do that and know that you can't just pick up a text from all that long ago, 2000 or 3000 or 5000 years ago and say, oh, this, this applies exactly today. Uh, for immigration, which our topic is today, it's a little different. People have been afraid of immigrants since the beginning of time. And the Bible, as you're gonna see in a minute, speaks unequivocally, full-throated advocacy for the immigrant. It calls on us to love the immigrant and protect the immigrant. And I think that that's just as applicable today as it was way back then. But let me go through, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a little survey of these biblical texts related to immigration. Now the first three are kind of some foundational theological pieces. Genesis 1, the story of creation, is a story of God's radical hospitality for us, for all of us that we were created, and in that story, God said, there's not enough to support and sustain this, these human beings. There's not enough for them to thrive. I'm going to make the whole beautiful, abundant world as an act of radical hospitality to welcome them to this place. So God's very act of creation was an act of radical hospitality for a stranger. In Genesis 12, and Billy's uh, liturgical prayer picked up on this beautifully. Abraham, at the time he was called Abram, began his calling, his following of God, by answering a call to immigrate, by answering a call to go from his homeland to a new land. So the ancestor of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Abraham, was an immigrant. His whole, his whole sense of self was that he had left his home to find a new home somewhere else. In Genesis 18, 1 through 8, Abram, at the time still called Abram, offers an example to us of radical hospitality of the stranger. That's when those three people visited Abram and Sarah at their tent, and Abram was outside under the oaks, and three strangers came along who we know, the reader of the text knows, were angels from God. And Abraham and Sarah enacted radical hospitality for these strangers, and as a result, received the blessing of their firstborn son. So those are some kind of general theological foundations for talking about immigration from a biblical perspective. Now I'm going to go through several that just get down into the nitty-gritty details. We'll start in Exodus 22, verse 21. Don't mistreat or oppress an immigrant, because you were once immigrants in the land of Egypt. Now it's important because we're gonna hear that over and over again, because you were once immigrants. It was a foundational principle for the identity of the people of Israel. 
that they had to immigrate to Egypt. If you remember the story, Joseph first went to Egypt because he was sold there by his brothers into slavery. He had some dreams that predicted a severe famine, like a regional famine throughout the, the Middle East. Uh, and so he had Pharaoh save up all kinds of grain so that when that famine hit, Egypt would be well stocked. When that famine did hit, his whole family had to immigrate. They were refugees from a famine who went to Egypt. And that, that act from that people became a part of their identity. We had to flee our homes. And so we are gonna remember that every time we see an immigrant to our land, because you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. You may have heard texts like the ones I'm about to read as stranger or foreigner. I'm reading from the Common English Bible, the most recent scholarly translation, and it just goes ahead and calls them immigrants. Again, Exodus 23, 9, don't oppress an immigrant. You know what it's like to be an immigrant because you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. Leviticus, two passages from Leviticus, and this is one of those ones where we're like, oh, Leviticus, there's a lot of strange stuff in there that's culturally specific to the time and hard to dis discern. But these kind of feel pretty relevant to today, don't they? When immigrants live in your land with you, you must not cheat them. Any immigrant who lives with you must be treated as if they were one of your citizens. You must love them as yourself. Why? Because you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. Le Leviticus 23, 2. And here's a different tact. When you harvest your land's produce, you must not harvest all the way to the edge of your field and don't gather the remaining bits of your harvest. Leave these items for the poor and the immigrant. I am the Lord your God. Moving on to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is, a re, is the fifth book of the Torah and a retelling of parts of the first four, summarizing the theology. And Deuteronomy then becomes the theological foundation for much of the, the Psalms and the prophets and the rest of the Bible. Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19, the Lord your God is the God of all gods and the Lord of all lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who doesn't play favorites and doesn't take bribes. God enacts justice for orphans and widows, and God loves immigrants, giving them food and clothing. That means you must also love immigrants. Why? Why must you love immigrants? Because, because you are immigrants in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 24, 24, 14. Don't take advantage of poor or needy workers, whether they are fellow Israelites or immigrants who live in your land or your cities. Deuteronomy 24, 19, 22, an expansion of the commandments about gleaning. Whenever you are reaping the harvest of your field and you leave some grain in the field, don't go back and get it. Let it go to the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow so that the Lord your God blesses you in all that you do. Similarly, when you beat the olives off your olive trees, don't go back over them twice. Leave the leftovers for your, the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. There's a, there's a trinity in there that we're going to hear over and over in the Bible. Immigrant, orphan, and widow. And we know from our stories in modern day that those are often all the same people. That the widows and the orphans are often the immigrants. Again, when you pick the grapes of your vineyard, don't pick them over twice. Let the leftovers go to the immigrants, the orphan, and the widow. Remember how you were slaves in Egypt. And that's why I'm commanding you to do this. Deuteronomy 27.19 takes a a more negative approach. Cursed is anyone who obstructs the legal rights of immigrants, orphans, or widows. Now we'll jump to Psalms. I found one passage in the Psalms, Psalm 146, 9. I am the Lord who protects immigrants, who helps orphans and widows. There's our trinity of my, um, marginalized people again. Uh, who makes the, but who makes the way of the wicked twist and turn. And then Zechariah 7, 9 and through 10. The Lord of the heavenly forces proclaims, make just and faithful decisions, show kindness and compassion to each other, don't oppress the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the poor, and don't plan evil against them. I'm not sure why it translates it stranger there. I didn't get a chance to look up if that's a different Hebrew word, but in that one it says where the holy trinity of widow, orphan, and immigrant, this one translates it stranger. 
Now we're going to jump to the epistles, and then we'll come back to the gospels. The one we just read, that Julie read this morning. Let mutual affection continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. A call back to the story of Abraham entertaining the angels. And then it says this. Remember those who are in prison as, those, as though you were in prison. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves are being tortured. Have empathy. When you see somebody suffering, imagine that that could be you. It goes back to the Matthew 7 te text that we all know. We don't know it's Matthew 7, probably. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then I'll just do one more from the epistles, James 1, 27. True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before the God, for God our heavenly parent, is this, to care for the orphans and the widows in their difficulty and to keep the world from contaminating us to care for those who are marginalized and to be uncontaminated by greed, to be uncontaminated by racism. Now let's turn to the Gospels. And there's two key passages. The first was again referenced in Billy's liturgical prayer. It's not super quotable, but it's the story from Matthew 2, where Jesus' family, when he's a baby, has to flee political persecution and become refugees and flee to Egypt. Now, it's thought that Matthew may have, this may be a fictional account, that Matthew may be sort of making this up as a way to, that everybody would have known this wasn't really what happened, but as a way to say, we are connecting this Jesus to Israel. This is what Israel did. Israel had to flee to Egypt as refugees. Jesus' own family had to flee to Egypt as refugees. And therefore, Jesus came out of Egypt back to us, just like the people of Israel. And so we are told there by Matthew that, yes, the very identity of Jesus Christ is that of a refugee and that of an immigrant. And then this passage that we've all heard many times if we've been in this church for a year or so from Matthew 25, we have committed in this church to be a Matthew 25 church, which is one of the PCUSA's denominational initiatives that commits us to anti-racism, anti-poverty work, and to being a thriving church that can reach out to the community. Matthew 25, where Jesus is imagined as the final judge over all the nations, which is an important detail. He's not judging in that text individuals. He's judging people. He's judging the nations. And he separates the sheep from the goats. And to the sheep, he says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. And to the goats, we'll hear what he says to the goats in a minute, but it's quite the opposite. I don't think we can overstate the importance of hospitality to the stranger when it comes to the biblical witness. We hear it over and over and over again. I, I want to be careful how I say this. I don't know how you can stand what's happening at the border with walls and people on horseback and whips chasing people down and families being separated and people being imprisoned. I don't know how you can say that's, that you support that and call yourself a Christian. Now, maybe there, maybe, I, and in fact, I do. I do know probably that what, what people think. And I think that those who support that think, well, as an individual, I'm supposed to be kind and hospitable, but national politics are different. National policies are different. But that doesn't really hold up. It doesn't hold up for one thing, because when Jesus calls us, he doesn't call us as individuals, he calls us as a people. He says, how did you act as a people towards others? How did you act with your power to the, toward those who are marginalized? It doesn't hold up because if I am called to be radically hospitable, then my family is called to be radically hospitable, and my church is called to be radically hospitable, and I'm called to call my neighborhood to be radically hospitable, and I'm called to call my nation to be radically hospitable. I don't see how we can divide that out and say, oh, the nation can do one thing, Christians have to do another. Now, I've said before, we live in a pluralistic society, and so we can't just say, I'm a Christian, and the nation should have Christian values. 
We have to find a way as people in a pluralistic society to base our decisions, to, to give witness to what we believe as people of faith, but then to also base our decisions on something broader. And that something broader that we need to talk about on the national level is human rights. And there's a human right that we need to consider as the right to freely move. The right to freely move around the planet if we want to. And it's a right that every single one of us in this room has. If you have a U.S. passport, you, have, you, you are experiencing open borders on this planet as a U.S. citizen. You take that passport, you can go to almost any nation in the world. You can visit, you can buy property, you can move there, you can stay with your family there, you can meet friends. We all have the right as U.S. citizens to move freely around this world. What we're saying to people at the border and to anybody who's trying to get to America is you don't have the right to move because you don't have enough money. You don't have the right to move because you're not an American. You don't have the right to move freely around the world because we are greedy and we've got a lot of stuff in the United States that we don't want you to have. And we're afraid that because you're poor, you're going to take it away from us. That's, our, that's the reason, that's the argument for restricting human rights to poor people, to Mexicans and Guatemalans and Venezuelans, to Ukrainians. That's what we do, is you don't have enough and we're afraid you're going to take our stuff. And so because you're poor, you don't have the same human rights as everybody else. As Christians, we can't stand for that kind of thinking. As Christians, we stand as people of faith to welcome, radically welcome the immigrant, and we have to stand for equal treatment for the equal value of any person on this earth to move around the planet in the same way we expect. Now we don't, when we talk about open borders, and I know I think a lot of progressive people would be like, oh no, open borders, that's too far. But when you talk about open borders, you're not saying anybody can go anywhere anytime. You're saying that, yeah, when we go to Canada, if we drive to Canada, they're going to check your driver's license. They're going to document who you are. They're going to ask you what's in your car, why you're going, where you're staying. And then they're going to let you go. That's what an open border is. It means that, yeah, we can, we can, nations have a responsibility to have some kind of control, but they don't have a right to stop people from moving around the planet. Now, I'll just tell a couple stories to illustrate what's going on at the border. And then I want to show, come back to the open border idea. So this is from New York Times reporter Eileen Sullivan, just describing something that she experienced as an example. I went to Reynosa, she says, in Mexico, across the border from McAllen, Texas. One mother and daughter I met from Honduras, the daughter is 15, and she was leaving class one day when she was kidnapped and raped by a local gang. Once girls hit their teens, they're really not safe. They're seen as fair game for these attacks. This mother, mother and daughter, once they get, got to Mexico, were kidnapped, probably by cartel members, and sexually assaulted for days before they escaped. She says there are countless stories like, like these. These are the people we're keeping out of our country. These are the people we're afraid of. These are the people that we're putting in cages. She also says, while I was in Reynosa, I saw Haitians, and we, we know Haitians in this church. We support Haitians in this church through Kai Papa New and Unity House. We know what's going on in Haiti. I saw Haitians and other migrants standing outside a shelter trying to get in, trying to talk to a pastor who was in charge. God bless this pastor for doing what he's called to do as a Christian. The pastor keeps a list of everyone in his shelter and nearby tent camps. Many of the groups that he keeps track of are simply there to regroup, to try to cross yet again. They crossed, they got turned away, they're gonna regroup, they're gonna try again because they're that desperate. Now we might think that this is all better now because Biden's the president or whatever. It's not. In an article from June of this year in Politico, in, in uh, partnership with the Marshall Project, which is a nonprofit news organization covering the US criminal justice system, it documents the Zargosa family. Alberto, Alberto Zargosa, 44, said he had, been in federal, he had been a federal policeman in Venezuela, but he ran afoul of the authoritarian president, Nicolas Maduro, 
who was transforming the police into a political militia controlled by the military. Zargosa said he was forced out of the police and driven from his home by threats. His wife left him, but his children wanted to come with him when he decided to flee his home. After the family made it to across the icy churning Rio Grande, border patrol agents met them and detained them. His 11-year-old daughter Alejandra describes the experience. She says she was put in a, a cell packed full of other immigrants with a dirty sink and a toilet with no doors in plain light. She said all the immigrants could see. Also, she said the lights in the cell were never turned off. We never knew what time it was because we couldn't see the night or the day. I think that's torture. Why couldn't they turn the lights off at night? Her father was held nearby, but her brother was separated from the family. He was 19. The sisters were sobbing in panic that he would be deported and they would be separated. Luckily, the family was able to reunite at a nonprofit respite center in Del Rio. Again, thank God there are people doing that work. Her time in detention, Alejandra, Alejandra said, left her afraid that the police in the U.S. were no different from the police her father was escaping. And then he will say to those on his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. What's happening at the border is morally depraved. We as people of faith must stand for something else. There is another way, and I wanna show a video that illustrates this. And this video is from a, a TV show based on a book called Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood. I'm sure that many of you have heard of this and seen it, but the premise is that America was taken over by a conservative religious minority. There was a coup, and women were basically enslaved um, for their reproductive, as, as baby makers, um, or as servants. It was sort of a massive patriarchal, unapologetic patriarchal takeover of the US. And so people were fleeing to Canada. And the video we're about to show is a woman who has fled to Canada and is at an, Im an immigrant center in Canada. Let me turn up the sound. Learn Spanish with real... And learn, yeah, learn Spanish. Thank you, Lord. 
<laughs> we can do that. If we, have the, if we just speak up and have the political will and advocate unapologetically for welcoming the immigrant, we can do that. We can make an immigration system that welcomes the immigrant, that says, hey, you are traumatized, clearly traumatized, you're fleeing violence, you're looking for a better life for you and your family. Here's a phone for a few months, here's some cash, here's medical insurance. Nice if we all had medical insurance, wouldn't it? You know, you know, there's food for you, here's some clothing, do you have family, we're gonna assign you a caseworker. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine in this political climate, but we can't lose sight of that vision for what it should be. And we have to keep advocating for what it can be. We cannot be afraid of people because they're poor. We cannot be afraid of people because they're black or brown or from some other country. Our calling as people of faith is to boldly, wholeheartedly, full-throatedly advocate for the immigrant, welcome the immigrant among us. Let mutual affection continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. We can do it as a country, and we can do it as individuals. It does, it does take both, doesn't it? It takes the interchange for us, for us who, who still feel, fear the strangers, some of us, who are seeking to change the way we practice radical hospitality in our individual lives. And that can mean any, it doesn't mean you're necessarily gonna bring a homeless person into your house, although that is what we're called to do. But we're not, might, maybe, maybe not ready for that. But it means that at the grocery store, when somebody is serving you, we are kind and generous to them. We compliment them. We are patient when clearly they're working for minimum wage and we're trying to buy you know, our cheesecake or whatever that we're gonna be patient with this person because we are welcoming and being hospitable to the stranger. It means that when we're at the restaurant, we are gonna be very kind to that server and we are gonna tip generously. 20% 20, 20 is the minimum. Sasha had to teach me that. I was like, I thought it was 15. She's like, Tom. <laughs> She's like, I was a server at I was a server at Po Boys, or whatever it was called, and people would tip me in pennies. You tip for 20% as a minimum. That's hospitality. Hospitality is when we see a stranger and we say, that could be an angel. And yeah, sometimes we're gonna have to be careful. There's a lot we could talk about with the squeegee workers and the fear that's being raised among us with that. How are we gonna navigate hospitality there? It's not always easy, and so it does take concerted effort as individuals to make our, heart, our hearts radically hospitable while also being safe. But we must then, as a people, as people of faith, advocate with our whole hearts and our whole minds for radical immigration reform. We need not apologize for talking about open borders. People are gonna say, ah, you got your head in the clouds. Like, no, we got our, hand, our hands in the Bible. This is what the Bible tells us. This is what our God calls us to do. We were all immigrants, and we are going to try now to change the way we treat other immigrants. Friends, there's a host of angels yearning for safety and freedom to come into the U.S. all around our borders. Our calling is to open our hearts and our arms and our borders to everyone in need. Amen.